Hello and welcome to worship at All Saints Lutheran Church. We're so glad that you have joined us virtually. And know that if you are watching the premiere of this video on Sunday morning at 9.15, you are also worshiping right alongside the brother, your brothers and sisters who are worshiping in the sanctuary this morning. So we celebrate our, our oneness in Christ and our, our unity as a body and are thankful for each and every one of you, wherever and however you are joining us this morning. We will celebrate Holy Communion as part of our worship service today, so invite you to gather those elements if you need to pause the video to do so. Uh, you may do so at this time. Uh, if you have wine or juice of some kind, or even water, you can use that. Um, and any sort of bread or cracker can serve as your communion bread this morning. And even if you only have one of the elements, um, it counts. So I hope you will participate with us in the means of grace this morning and feel God's love for you in that. Let us worship together. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Philippians, the first chapter. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. 
and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A good deal of the New Testament was born out of socially distanced Christian community. It's true, or at least physically distanced Christian community, and that is most certainly true of Paul's letter to the Philippians that we just heard from. And I thought, I, as, as though I read this passage many times before, this time I could really feel the weight of Paul's tension and yearning and love as he writes to this church that he has helped birth into being from, from the beginning and writes from the enforced isolation of a prison cell. Several days ago, Pastor Dan shared a devotion about what it's like to be in the middle of a struggle a middle, the middle part of a, of a long, hard slog. And here we are in the middle of this pandemic. We don't know what the end will look like or when it will come. And so we're drawing on strengths and resources that have sustained us in the past. And we're also discovering new ones along the way. And we're relying on some blind faith that uh, when the future comes, that comes to meet us will uh, bring good things. It was true, the same was true for Paul and the church at Philippi. This letter is from the middle of it all. Paul is voicing his very uncertainty, be, uncertainty about whether they will be able to be together again like normal. Uncertain of how much of the past will be replicated in the future and whether this season of uncertainty will ever come to an end. He's stretched by the paradox of isolation and community. He's addressing the paradox of privilege and suffering, and he's doing the best to live faithfully as a citizen of heaven called to dwell in the here and now. He's in what one commentator describes as a liminal space, and in this liminal space, Paul finds himself living in and speaking to all these paradoxes, several in-betweens all at once. There are parallels to the moment that we find ourselves in and lessons to be learned from how Paul and the Philippians inhabit this liminal space. So let's explore them just a little bit. First, I think it's worth noting that Paul's isolation is real. So real that he sometimes feels he would be better off dead. Now, he puts it much more eloquently than that in a much more spiritual sense, but the reality is that there are times when it feels that for Paul, this struggle may not be worth continuing. His string of civil disobedience has resulted in beatings and persecutions and threats and imprisonment. His radical opinions regarding Gentile inclusion have alienated him from fellow apostles. He wrestles with his own sinful nature and on top of that, he is chained up and unable to carry out the mission into which he was saved in the first place. But then a little bit of human ingenuity breaks into his isolation. There's this hybrid mechanism of in-person and the technology of the day that comes to his rescue. Epaphroditus shows up and provides him with a link. Epaphroditus is a member of the church in Philippi, and he comes to deliver Paul a gift from the church. But his itineration not only fills Paul in on what's going on in the church of Philippi, but it gives him an opportunity to connect virtually with the entire congregation via letter. And it seems to aid Paul in coming to this kind of epiphany about his calling. Sure, I'd rather be in heaven, where I'd certainly be better off. But for you, it's better if I stay. That's what he says in this letter. And, and he further goes on to say, now that I'm convinced of this, I'm not only going to hang around, 
but I'm going to continue to walk alongside you as much, with as much faith and joy as I can muster, even from a distance. And Lord knows it's my desire to come and be with you and celebrate together all that God has done. But, quote, whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, end quote. What, li- what makes life worth living for Paul right now despite all the challenges he has to endure, is that this community still needs him. He still has the opportunity to serve in meaningful ways for the sake of the gospel, to inspire and grow people in their faith. And he has this sense of missional vocation, that this is what he was made to do. So it's no surprise that one of his agenda items in communicating with the Philippians is to encourage them, to exhort them to tend to their relationships with one another, especially insofar as it impacts their shared mission. Be of one mind. He will say that over and over again in this letter. Be of one mind. He wants them striving side by side, not against each other. Now, we all know how difficult that is right now. I touched on that in my last sermon. In fact, we are not all in the same space right now at this very moment of worship, in part because we are not of all of the same mind about what risks are worth taking or how best to tend to our well-being in the midst of this pandemic. Philippi wasn't all that different. It was made up of people, too. Among its leadership were two strong women, Euodia and Syntyche, whom Paul describes as co-workers in the gospel. But some sort of tension has arisen between them, and it's rippled through the rest of the congregation. And in chapter 4, he will address them specifically, calling upon them to work out their relationship, be of the same mind, and for the rest of the congregation to help and support them and uplift them. Furthermore, there are references to opponents from outside the congregation, People trying to infiltrate the community with some kind of gospel that that is other entirely, perhaps one that requires circumcision for salvation. Be of one mind doesn't mean some kind of robotic assimilation. It means a shared resolve and purpose in pertaining to the central mission of bringing people the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ. That's what's important and unifying for Paul. Wherever and however God's people go about it, this is where being of the same mind matters. Because what Paul is really enjoining people to do is to be of the same mind as Jesus Christ. And therein lies their unity. Being of the same mind as Christ, we will be told in the next chapter in Philippians, means being in the mindset of one who didn't believe that godlike control, lording it over all things, was something worth clinging to. Instead, he chose to abandon his heavenly post, to endure the hardship and humility of liminal space, as one who was fully divine but also fully human. Disciples of Christ are called to take a similar journey which Paul alludes to in the end of this passage for today when he speaks of the Philippians being afforded the privilege, quote, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him. That is, suffering on his behalf. You see, even in the stratified, colonized world of the first century Mediterranean region, Philippians enjoyed a certain degree of privilege. The city was the urban hub of a Roman province, so its inhabitants were Roman citizens. It was on an important trade route, so that meant there were opportunities there to make a living at something other than being a peasant farmer. But Philippians who adopted the way of Jesus stood to lose some, if not more, than what they gained from those perks. The practice of their faith was viewed as seditious and anti-Roman, by the authorities. 
Their responsibility to care for orphans and widows and the downtrodden put a dent in their coffers. Their acceptance of unclean Gentiles at their tables put them on the outs with the Jewish establishment. They had everything to lose. And yet, Paul refers even to this choice to relinquish some of their rights for the sake of the gospel as privilege. He doesn't deny or minimize their suffering. He expects that just as Jesus suffered on our behalf, Christians will be called to suffer on his behalf. And it's real suffering. But it's also privilege. And that causes me to wonder and to think about how might the particular suffering we may be enduring right now be colored by our privilege? And is there a way to bend that narrative of suffering and privilege more intentionally toward the service of the gospel? Something for you to ponder and chew on this week, and I'd love for you to send me a a comment on what you've, what you've come up with around that. But as I think about the things that are causing me the most stress and hardship, I can almost certainly identify a privilege that goes along with each one. Paul knows the very real ache of living one day to the next, knowing that things are not as they should be. And it informs the full confidence he has that Something better awaits in our true home with Christ. And yet it is that very truth that gives us the strength to live bold, gospel-centered lives in imitation of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, as Paul reminds us, Christ is sovereign. And we, in all of our efforts, live and die in him. And so in that knowledge, we can live with all our might as we strive side by side. And also, in freedom, we can let go and let God. Let God do what only God can do. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, Paul writes. And he uses a political term there. It's like he's saying, live as a citizen. Live as a citizen of heaven here on earth here and now, in the middle. Jesus chose to join us in the liminal space, in the muddled middle, humbling himself to the point of death so that he might be exalted. And so he has promised, shall we be. Hard-pressed now, we will nonetheless come out shining because our faces reflect his light. And when we're striving side by side for his kingdom above all else, we can already begin to see it, even when we're six feet away. To him be the glory. Amen.
sing together, Jesus Christ is living bread. Come from loneliness and longing, here in peace we have been fed. Blessed are those who from this table live their days in gratitude. Taste and see the grace eternal, taste and see that God Let us pray for the needs of the world. Holy God, who hears our cries and pities our groans, you are ever faithful. We come to you with our petitions for ourselves and our community. For our church and its leaders, that we may be of open mind and open heart, that we might be the Christian leaders you have called us to be, and that the church be an instrument of love, justice, and peace. For our country and global community, that all may be peaceful, fair, and respectful of all peoples, no matter the religion, color, gender, or kind of government. For our local community, in particular, we pray for Joanne Christensen, Audrey Mars, Don Noller, Diane Johnson, Marita Fink, Paul Eastman, Norma Head, Sue Barsky, Phyllis Kronk, Carrie, Mohammed Riza Kazi, the family of Loring and Margaret Court upon the death of Loring's sister, Dorothy Carr, and the Carpenter family upon the death of their beloved mother and grandmother. We pray for those who are overlooked in our society, the poor, the young, the old, the bereaved, and the oppressed. Help us to see them and to be with them. And for the special intentions we hold in our hearts. Gracious and loving God, we know that you hear us and are always with us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ, cup of salvation.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, friends, may Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all